I'm AC. I'm from uh, Vive and the software team. So today, this section, we are going to introduce the future of our XApp development and the SDK. So according to the GDC survey this year, Vive still be one of the most popular VR development platform. Uh, it is because Vive is uh, much more than hardware. It's also all about you here to join the global community of uh, software development. So to me, developer is always with unlimited imagination. So that make me keep thinking about what we should provide to collaborate with uh, developer for the future. To also support developer to bring this imagination connect to the reality. So today, uh, we will have uh, four key areas to share and have a detailed section one by one later. So the four key areas are, the first one is uh, experience. The second one is presence. The third one is interaction. And the final one is augmentation. OK. In experience, our 3DSP audio uh, SDK will give you and the content to experience in the virtual world with realistic and uh, accurate acoustic model. It also provides the high order ambisonic and audio effect with different material in the space. Okay? So, we know it is important to developer. It's also designed for the low weight and the user friendly. We will have a detailed session later, but I suggest now you can consider it to change to our 3DSP audio. The next one is uh, presence. SINable SDK will do the eye tracking, eye detection. So eye contact is uh, one important factor to make people feel alive in the VR social experience. Eye tracking can do the interaction and the control, but that is not enough. We will also have the SINAPL to support the lip detection. With the lip, lip detection accessory, you can detect the lip real time and the detail, which we believe can reach the facial emanation and reach your VR experience. Of course, people talk about the foveal rendering, so SINAPL will support foveal rendering to benefit the performance saving. Uh, we will share the plugin for that to help developer to easily to tune in the, the, the quality and the performance. The third one will be interaction. Hand is always the natural way to do control. So when I first time put the hand mount to my kid, before I hand over the controller to him, he already stopped to wave something to try to grab something. Even I don't teach him how to do. Of course, in that moment, nothing happened. Why? We don't have a hand checking SDK. But today, we will share the hand checking SDK to support all for you. The final one is the X engine. So Hemang right now is not only bring the user to the virtual reality. We believe it can use to see the world, sense the environment, to, deal, to do the 3D reconstruction, and also the scene understanding. So that's why we also believe this will be the window when we connect for further AR and AI. So with these four key area, HTC target to do the Vive reality, and today we will happy to share you the Vive Sense SDK. You can start to download this for major SDK. And with this technology, with your imagination, we believe we can have a future with a human, hum, humanity, okay? So in the end, let's join together on Vive platform. Thank you. And uh, next, I will invite Avery to introduce the 3DSP audio.
Hello, everybody. My name is Avery. Today, I am very happy to show you our audio SDK. Our audio SDK is a Vive 3 DSP. That means a 3D sound perception. Okay. Uh, for today's topic, you might be very curious what is Vive 3 DSP and uh, where is it? I guess uh, there are a lot of content developers in this meeting room. So uh, I think when you make a content, you might prepare a lot of image materials, like the helicopter, and the, uh, the freighter, the crowder, the spray, and so on. Anyway, audio materials are also very important because the helicopter has helicopter noise. The freighter, the spray, the wind, even the fire, they all have their sounds. Web 3 DSP can make those audio materials become real. So uh, I can say Web 3 DSP can be everywhere in a VR world. Actually, Web 3 DSP is a special audio SDK. Special audio, you might be curious again, what is special audio? When the sound source is uh, located somewhere, a human, even he close his eye, he still can realize where the sound source is. Why? Because there is the sound level difference, time difference, even the sound transmission path difference. And so this human can know where the sound source is. These are three kinds of factors. They are so-called HRTF, head-related transfer function. Actually, we spend a lot of hours on HRTF modeling. We record the sound response at a lot of position and a lot of angles, even under AV 5 degrees angle. And so we can perform HRTF very precision. Of course, not only HRTF is the spatial audio factor, actually there are also other factors. They are uh, also related to uh, spatial audio, like the sound refraction, sound reverberation, material sound response, and the ambisonic operation. Ambisonic, this topic becomes uh, very popular in recent years. Here I just briefly talk about ambisonic. Like I said above, we spend a lot of hours on HRTF modeling, right? That means uh, there are a lot of uh, virtual speakers in our mathematical model. And so it is very easy for us to uh, operate a virtual speaker array and a virtual speaker beamforming. And so the directional sound feeling can be presented in this SDK. Actually, this is also what uh, ambisonic operations do. And uh, you can see uh, on the below is a picture. This pattern uh, shows the beamforming shape at a different uh, ambisonic order. Basically, the higher ambisonic order means more complicated combination of virtual speakers. In this SDK, the third order ambisonic is provided. By the way, there are uh, a lot of very unique features in this SDK, like the high-res uh, 3D audio supporting or uh, the occlusion effect without any crider requirement. They are very unique. You can uh, just take a view here to see what, what they are. I will also introduce them in my following presentation. Okay, this is the architecture of uh, this SDK. At the first, we have our own algorithm, like a uh, run audio application, sound equalizer, ambisonic operation, HRTF data, and so on. And then uh, we transfer those algorithm to be a native library. At this moment, that means you can directly use this native library for your application. We also use this native library to build the some plugin for game engines, like the Unity or Unreal. And uh, this is the overall supporting status. So far, we support, we, we support uh, Windows and Android base. And then uh, I'd like to show you the example in Unity environment. There are four kinds of objects in our Unity plugin uh, environment. And uh, one is audio source object, 
The other one is listener object. We also have occlusion object and the room object. And the last part is about the audio source object. This object is the main control function. So you can set up the audio configuration here to choose which one you like or which one you don't like. Like the DRC, 3D sound effect, and so on. And then uh, the picture on the right hand side means the process flow chart, and the block on the top is the source object. This source object, it records a lot of information, like the source position, run condition, occlusion properties, and so on information. And then the process block gets the information. Finally, it switches its output, like the sound specializer result, or sound decay model, and so on. Audio source object, it also supports uh, high-res audio input. Actually, MIB3 DSP is the only one SDK in the world to support high-res 3D audio application, like the screenshot from Unity. You can see the sample rate is uh, 192 kHz. That means there is no problem to process this kind of audio file and then apply a sound specializer on it in this SDK. In this SDK, the sound decay model can be also switched. Ideally, in the real, uh, ideally, when the sound is under transmission, the sound level decay status, it should be corresponding to the sound transmission distance square because the suffering area is increasing during this uh, transmission. However, in the real world, it is not really so ideal because uh, the different sound frequency means different sound decay capability. And so, we record the sound response again at a lot of operation with different distances. And so, the, the closest to the real world sound decay model can be presented in this SDK, like the blue curve. Of course, there are also other curves you can choose in this SDK, like the linear curve or constant curve. The binaural mode for a uh, run audio application is also allowed in this SDK. In the real world, sometimes when a human, uh, he stands uh, around the corner in the room, that means uh, the sound reflection pace should be different for both ear of the human. And so if you choose the binaural mode for run audio application, the sound feeling can be closer to the real world status. We also have uh, sound equalizer features in this SDK. Actually, sound equalizer is not a very unique concept. However, uh, there is a limitation uh, in Unity built-in sound equalizer. I, I, I believe there are a lot of uh, audio developers they will use uh, sound equalizer to tune their audio file. However, if uh, the limitation existing, uh, is, it, 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 might, uh, it might be a problem. So, um, Web3 DSP provides another sound equalizer here. Because uh, the equalizer in Unity built-in built -in case, uh, this sound equalizer can be only put on the audio mixer, not the audio source. So, it is a little inconvenient. So, Web3 uh, DSP, DSP provides uh, another sound equalizer. This sound equalizer can be directly put on the audio source. That means you can quickly uh, edit your audio file without any audio mixer. And uh, these two kinds of sound equalizer, they can be running at the same time. We also uh, have a future so-called audio file export. It can export your audio file with a sound equalizer result. That means the sound equalizer result can be used again in the other project. Okay, And this part is about the uh, run object. By this aperture, you can quickly build a sound environment that you like, like the picture on the top. The different material can be set on the different wall. And the different material means different uh, sound response. For example, this chart shows the sound refreshing rate in different materials, concrete and the foam. And then you can see the sound response is very different in both of them. We also have a room process service. Uh, 
Actually, in the run audio application, the most important thing is to set up the boundary condition of the run. But uh, sometimes you might just have a very common environment in your content project, like the living room, best room, or church. At this moment, this situation, it is welcome to directly use our room PC service. You can just do nothing. You only need to uh, choose one of our room PC model, and then everything can be ready. So it is very convenient. In the current status, there are five kinds of room process model in this SDK. In the future, we also plan to uh, increase the varieties of room process model. We also have a material package. There are uh, 12 kinds of material in this SDK, or maybe you can choose the user defined to design your own material. In the future, we plan to increase the material kinds from 12 to uh, even over than 50. And uh, uh, the background audio application is also allowed in Web3 DSP. In the real world, there should be a very slight environment sound at the background, like the air condition, refrigerated noise, such kind of slight environment sound. If you can put the environment sound in your content project, that means uh, it can uh, it can be a it it can be helpful to uh, enhance the end user's sound feeling, or maybe you can you you just want to play the background music in your content. You can also uh, directly put a music file in this feature, and then audio back, uh, background audio feature can automatically play the music file. Web uh, three DSP has released one years ago. In this one year, we got a lot of feedbacks from developers. So we have some false plans for our run effect. The first plan is about a uh, run shape. In the current status, we only support uh, the rectangular run shape. In the future, we plan to support the complex run shape. The second plan is about a uh, convolution run effect. That means uh, if you have a sound response data at somewhere, in the future, you can directly put the, da the data into our SDK, and then Web3 DSP can uh, perform the sound environment very well. The last plan is about the material. Like I said above, we plan to uh, enhance the material package. Okay, this part is about the occlusion object. Uh, here. There are two kinds of occlusion model in our SDK. One is the traditional request model, and the other one is a geometric occlusion model. In the traditional request model, you need to put a collider on the wall, and then there are a lot of rays casted from uh, one side of the wall, the wall to the other side. And then you need to count how many rays blocked by the collider, and then the cover ratio can be estimated and so. Uh, the occlusion effect can be presented in this SDK. However, in our geometry occlusion model, you don't do anything. You don't need a collider anymore. You just need to uh, set up the wall as an occlusion object, and then everything can be done. Very convenient. In this page, I'd like to show you the advantage of our occlusion model. There are two kinds of occlusion model in our SDK, right? One is uh, Request model and the other one is geometry occlusion model. In our geometry occlusion model, there is no need to uh, use the collider anymore in your content project at the wrong time. That means you can save a lot of system, uh, system computing resource and the GPU resource to benefit other application, like uh, the image process, this kind of purpose. Also, our occlusion object can be moved everywhere in the content. That means uh, it is movable, not only be fixed at somewhere. Furthermore, cover ratio, cover ratio means occlusion rate. Oc uh, in web 3 DSP geometry occlusion case, it can calculate the projection area of an occlusion object on some transmission path. And so the inference area can be estimated, and so the cover ratio can be performed very detailed. Not only just response yes or no, 100% occlusion rate, audio percent. 
it is too rough. So uh, see the table again. I can say our occlusion model is the best. And the last part is about the listener object. Listener object is the final configuration for listening. So it is very easy to find a, find a global gain here. And uh, basically, Web3 DSP is a highway independent SDK. However, we still have an we still have an optimization for Web4 handset. That means if you choose a uh, Web4 as your contemporary, the end user can have the best sound feeling by this feature. There is still a uh, there is still a function for listener recording. By the recording result, you can review if there is anything need to be adjusted in your content project. A Mesonic decoder is also uh, presented in Web3 DSP. You can just uh, click the check box here and then everything can be ready. In the current status, only the, only the first one order MB, MBX file can be allowed in this SDK. The four channels WXYZ in this MBX file, they should be corresponding to uh, the ACM format. Actually, ACM format is most widely used nowadays by a lot of major media like the Google, Facebook, and so on. So Unity also only support ACM format. Here, I'd like to highlight some features in our SDK. We have very precision HRTF. We have a third order ambisonic Web3 DSP even uh, is the only one SDK to support a high-res 3D audio application. We also have a binary mode for run effect. We have a run preset service. We have the best geometry occlusion model. And uh, we also support an ambisonic decoder. Not only that, we also have a lot of user-friendly features, like uh, our audio file expo, background audio. And uh, like I say, we have an optimization for web handset, right? In the future, we might plan to uh, have uh, the, the integration with web SDK. That means we might have more chance to contact more devices. If we can uh, get the information about those devices, we can also provide the optimizations for them. Let's the item, lower setting. Uh, actually, we spend some hours on, uh, on optimization for computing. We even use the matrix operation skill to uh, save about 40% computing consumption. We also have a lightweight setting for audio project. That means uh, after lightweight, set, lightweight setting, uh, the audio file sound feeling uh, is very similar to the original one, but uh, the computing resource is just costed very little. This is uh, the lightweight setting. You can bypass very small signal. You can uh, mute very fast source. You can choose uh, the speed up mode for run audio application. And you can also choose the very light mode for geometry occlusion model. And then this is uh, the result. On the left hand side is uh, the original, re original result. And on the right hand side is the result after lightweight setting. Below is our testing condition. And then you can see in the original result, the computing consumption is about 15%. And then uh, after lightweight setting, <coughs> the computing consumption is uh, no more than 10%. So lightweight setting is very efficient, right? This page shows you the related link about Web3 uh, DSP. And uh, you are welcome to uh, visit our website. You can download our audio SDK or leave your feedbacks on our forum. Okay, I guess uh, you all scanned the QR code already. Let's keep going on our presentation. Now I'd like to uh, ask you the question again. Where is Bible 3 DSP? Actually, Web3 DSP is everywhere. Okay. 
and uh, what is Vibe 3 DSP? Vibe 3 DSP is a special audio SDK. It can provide a very real immersive audio experiences for the end users. Vibe 3 DSP is a real, efficient, and user-friendly SDK. <coughs> it has a lot of uh, audio features, like the rune effect or cushion effect and so on. Uh, now, there are uh, Unity plugin and Unreal plugin and uh, native, native libraries in this SDK. My presentation is finished. Thanks for your listening. But uh, I still have, I still have uh, demos for you. Uh, I have two demos. The first demo is about the occlusion effect. The testing, uh, the testing condition is a living room and the sound source is set up on the TV. I will operate the listener to uh, move everywhere and then you can experience our occlusion effect. My second demo is about the rune, rune audio effect. Everything is sent as uh, the previous uh, demo, but uh, the sound source is switched from TV to the listener. That means the, t the listener is speaking, okay? And then I will operate the listener to uh, go into the room and leave there, and then you can see uh, our room effect. Let's go on our demo. Okay, now uh, the sit listener is standing on the, on the, in the living room and then uh, I will operate the listener to uh, move to outside. Patrick, could you uh, louder the speaker? Okay, and you can see uh, in the screen, there are two numbers, right? Those numbers means uh, 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 occlusion cover ratio, and uh, uh, different position means the different occlusion rate, so the cover ratio is changed. And uh, when I change the position again, the sound is occluded. And then uh, if I go into the living room again, the cushion effect is disappear. Okay? One more time. When I leave the living room, and then uh, the occlusion effect is appear. And then when I change the position, the occlusion condition is changed too. And so, you can experience our occlusion effect, okay? And uh, I'd like to show you my second demo. Second demo is about the Run audio application. And uh, like I say, uh, I will switch the sound source from TV to the listener, like this. Own book of transportation rates. Pets, okay, that means uh, the listener is Western, speaking. If correctly boxed, Cents and then I will uh, operate the listener to go into a room. What more do you want? Aren't they pets? Aren't they domestic? Aren't they correctly boxed? What? He turned and walked back and forth rapidly with a furious look on his face. Pets, he said. P E. T S twenty five cents each. Two times twenty five is fifty. Okay. Can you Do you feel the good audio reverberation or reflection effect? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. He ran his hand Again. through the pages and stopped at page sixty four. Mike Flannery. The agent of the Interurban Express Company leaned over the desk in the company's office okay. in Westcott and shook his fist. Okay. My, my demo is finished. Thank, thanks for you. And uh, 
Now, uh, let's uh, welcome. Let's welcome Andrew, who is a sound designer with a lot of experiences with uh Bible Three DSP, and uh, let's welcome. Thank you to Avery and thank you to Aussie for coming out to the United States to present on behalf of the acoustics team. Uh, my name is Andrew Champlin. I'm a sound designer at HTC Creative Labs. If you don't know, that's a sort of company inside the company of HTC. We're responsible for industrial design and consumer hardware, first party software experiences, uh, future concepts. Uh, I've contributed sound to VR since about 2016 on Vive Home and then lead sound on a couple of projects that people have actually used like Vive Video, Vive Port versions one and two, Vive Arcade, our Steam Home Driftwood and the forthcoming Vive Reality System which we debuted at CES and Vinay talked about a little this morning. I wanted to talk about one portion of that called Origin which in the future will sort of serve as your gateway to all Vive Reality System experiences and use my experience on the sound design of that to illustrate two points. One, how we design sound for VR at Creative Labs, which I hope to illustrate is not that different from how you might if you have experience designing sound for 3D experiences already. And two, the areas in which by 3DSP sort of extends and enables that existing expertise to go into VR, how it meets the needs of immersive audio, and I'll provide a couple specific examples, uh, and how it enables you as a game developer to do what it is you do best, which in 2019, let me check my notes, is monetizing other people's dance moves? Is that what we're doing? Oh, no, no, it's uh, being creative, of course, being creative. Love you, Tim. Um, so we wanna allow you to extend your existing expertise and make uh, use of skills that you already have. And that's actually one of the ways I like to talk about VR sound design is that it is accumulative. It's evolutionary, not revolutionary. Like game and film sound before it, it rolls up all of our prior art and findings into you know, another medium. And in the case of VR, extends it in a couple specific ways, uh, like theater, blocking, immersive theater experiences like Sleep No More, uh, event and location-based entertainment, things that seem pretty foreign to game sound, but when you examine them, aren't that different from projects that artists and designers have kind of busied themselves with for a long time. When you need to translate those skills into a new medium, you need not new ideas, but new tools. At HTC, we want to make tools that, uh, yeah, whoop, whoop. we want to make tools that uh, build on that foundation while at the same time giving shape to the standards of VR sound as they emerge. Tools that just by the nature of using them reinforce the habits that make great immersive ex experiences easier to make. So what are we carrying forward from game sound design? What foundation are we building on? Well, it turns out there's quite a lot of it. Uh, some of the things that were said in the early goings of VR, in particular by Chet Falasak at one time at Valve, congratulations on the new company, um, 3D sound is a solved problem. The basic left, right, and amplitude-based trigonometry has been with us since the 90s in shooters like Doom. Uh, in Doom, for unexplained reasons that are not in the fiction, but you will find in my fan fiction, uh, your character's perception was welded to the butt of a gun. So when you were turning, you had to turn your entire aperture to perceive sounds, again, in this basic left-right positional audio. That doesn't reflect how we experience sound, and it produces subsequently a much more simplified representation, even in the most advanced uh, modern games, that they've not been able to decouple the ears from the body. And what you get with positionally tracking HMDs like the Vive is that realistic tracking, the position, translation, pitch, yaw, and rotation of the ears, which is pretty momentous. And it proves how much headroom there is in that basic trigonometry, which has again existed since the 90s. VR has a way of refreshing technologies like this because the limitations of reality no longer exist. Avery mentioned ambisonics, which has been a subject of active research since the 1970s but it's taken VR to make it commercially viable because you could never get all of the speakers necessary to represent higher order ambisonic sound arrays. And so you're basically right out of the box with the Vive, enriching sound design practice that you've already been doing, which is important because in VR, you are essentially going to be using basic 3D positional sound for most of your sound sources. Uh, it's not uncommon for less than 10% of your sounds to employ advanced spatial audio, and there's a very good reason for that. It's not simply to save CPU resources. It's when a user suspends their disbelief and engages in your experience, they rely on you to provide clear, concise, directed sound that not only represents, but enhances reality. 
And this makes sense when you think about it. It wasn't as if when we developed surround sound for movies, we started putting a lot of dialogue in the back right channel. But where'd the dialogue go? I don't hear the dialogue anymore. It's just back there. We keep it in the center. And no one has felt disadvantaged by the fact that all the dialogue is coming out of a single place. The advent of spatial audio for movies increased the creative flexibility of sound designers, but it didn't change the way we make and consume stories. And so ironically, for somebody who was on stage ostensibly to promote advanced spatial audio, I'm going to tell you a secret. The more important your sound is, the less advanced spatial processing you're going to apply to it. Which leads us to a provocative conclusion. Sound design, as you have practiced it in 3D games, is completely applicable to VR in the state that you are currently practicing it. So your mixing acumen, your snapshot acumen, your game engine implementation acumen, all of this is a completely valid skill set. Or to put it in another way, conversely, nothing about VR, despite what you may have heard, automates or invalidates the need for sound design and sound designers. I'll go further. Without good sound design and without good sound designers, there can be no good VR, full stop. I want to say it louder for the hiring managers in the back. <laughs> you have the highest concentration of sound design talent in this city, in this conference for the next seven days, and they are mysteriously underemployed. It is sound designer season. Go get you one. So what does VR actually bring to the table? What VR brings to the table is the expectation of a more naturalistic environment for these sounds to exist in. The smaller details any good sound designer will tell you often take the largest amount of time. It's not the big things, the design thing. Like I said, those are always front, center, left, right. Those are production work at best. But the sensation of holding a seashell to your ear, the sound the wind makes flanging gently against a curved wall, these are the things that take a lot of time. And it's here where 3DSP is most helpful. Around the edges, just out of view. Again, creating that element of shading and texture that VR enables and that players expect. So let's talk about origin. Origin is, again, uh, our landing space for a Vibe Reality System. It's going to be the frame around which we put every experience. And when I first saw the, uh, the concept art coming out of our art department, I was immediately impressed, as I'm sure you are now, by the sort of monolithic scale of the architecture. I think our artists are some of the best in the business at getting the scale right, and they should be. They've been at it for a minute. So the, 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 uh, the origin space is just variety of texture, monolithic scale. It's something that I wanted to communicate with a lot of small details that add up to a large effect. Again, those things that really reinforce the reality of the place, because the place looks and feels real. And I knew I wouldn't accomplish it through huge shifts in tone, but rather by areas that rewarded close listening. This is how your sound designers work, by the way. Uh, we work sort of inductively from the design and aesthetic response of a place down to the specific tool execution level. It's not something as if we're like thinking about what tools or what particular middleware we want to use to approach a problem. We start with ideas. And so we're at HTC attempting to kind of offload some of that tool and execution level thinking. And uh, here's a couple areas in which I did. So there's the micro level of sound design. Like I said, those areas that kind of like have those point sources, like you could think of them as point lights if you're a lighting artist, that provide that level of detail. And there were a couple areas that I saw when I was going through the run through, uh, wind through the branches, tidal touch tanks, the water features that are illustrated here and throughout the space. Uh, and through the lattice work between the poured concrete, I really liked the idea of the wind blowing a series of harmonic overtones. I knew that I wanted these to reward close listening, so I made them spatial. The traditional sound design technique for this is to make a random container. You put a bunch of sounds in it, you populate it, you make the pitch and volume slightly different, bada bing, bada boom, you got sounds. That's exactly what I did. It took all of three clicks to take this from, again, a fairly rote practice sound design technique to something that really I felt enriched the space because you had the positional tracking on these point sources, which again, as not especially important source, sources, were easy to ignore. But what was cool about it was something Avery mentioned, the naturalistic fall off curve that our engineering team has toiled over, that made it really turnkey to do this in a lot of different places and not necessarily have to worry about how to be perceived at different angles. This is a huge concern in VR because you're player is constantly moving their head, they're teleporting. You don't necessarily know how close they're going to be to something. So to have something that's based on the inverse squares law, that something is scientifically agreed upon to represent sound naturalistically, it makes it really easy to really quickly populate an area with a lot of random sounds and give it life. I know that sound designers like to get really particular about their uh, fall off curves. Like, is it logarithmic? Is it linear? Is a sine fade too little? Is a cosine fade too much? 
But especially in VR, you're working with like small teams. And I've had this happen before where a very fussed over fall off curve that I've submitted to engineering was determined to be not loud enough at a certain angle. And I'll take it uh, from my friend Marie Kondo here. It went from something to spark joy to something that decidedly didn't. Also, does anybody really know how to work the Bayesian curves? In like, am I, is it just me? Those are impossible. Yeah, no, okay, thank you. Whew. So this automates that. Again, this is something that you see repeatedly in 3DSP. For a designer, from a design perspective, it takes the, the kind of grunt work out of making something higher order, something more immersive. That's the micro level. Let's talk about the macro. So we have Ambisonics audio sources. Ambisonics is the most fiendishly difficult concept in sound design, and I dimly understand it myself. It is so complicated that here at GDC last year at an audio and programming roundtable, again, highest concentration of sound design talent in the known universe, the session was derailed for a full 20 minutes while we round robin Wikipedia at Ambisonics to figure out exactly what somebody said at the beginning of the session, just to unpack it. It doesn't help that the way that you record Ambisonics is something that looks like an everlasting gobstopper attached to a vape rig. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin with that. But don't worry, we have one and we've recorded it. And also a lot of these recordings are commercially available. So it's completely viable to use Ambisonics in this sort of employed, direct way without having to think too much about the higher orders. I'll tell you how I did it. So we do have one of these. And uh, we recorded a windstorm. And it was converted into a B format. Again, like 16 completely unnecessary steps. Four channel audio file that renders down into two channels. Remember, for VR, at this point, we're designing for the headphone experience most of the time. So those two channels take that sound field, which in, in the 3DSP we represent as a first order ambisonics field, and translates it to a two channel left right thing that can then be subjected to uh, effects. So I've added this four channel file. It's a global setting. I don't have to worry about phasing issues of a bunch of discrete 3D wind files that I'm now expecting users to rotate left and right. Are they stereo? Do I have to take the channel information out? I have this thing that I can almost take for granted that I can then subject to effects like convolution reverb, which we've used uh, something outside of the company, but we're thankfully developing now to be much more performant. Uh, the flanging effect next to walls. I essentially have this uh, character that can accompany you throughout the experience and really reinforces the sense of form and void that the space communicates. And finally, uh, the last thing that Avery touched on and something that I was initially suspicious about because we all have our ways of dealing with this, um, Geometric occlusion. I've never really found a solution that worked especially well, that didn't improve on the standard sound design practice of blocking off a couple of areas, using low and high pass filters, and there you go. But there's a lot of limits to that when you're working in VR specifically, especially in a place like Origin that is simultaneously very large and very dense. It can get pretty clumsy. So you have a couple of unconventional volumes here too, uh, where there's an open pier and there's a turbulent water storm. And it's entirely possible that the user in VR is kind of tilting back and forth and getting a different vantage point on it. So it's here where like take a occlusion volume, rotate it 90 degrees, suddenly you have something that seems much more realistic because I have a random container firing off wave and surf sounds and the player is able to sort of like get a sense that it's actually happening somewhere close and then investigate and then get that reward. So you have a sort of sense of built-in discovery in something that, again, used to be a fairly binary on-off, it's low-pass filtered or it isn't. So again, that's my time. Uh, that was our 3DSP deployment in Vive Origin, and I hope that you're able to take these tools and these lessons and make something even better. Thanks. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce our uh, software liaison, impresario, some have called him a czar. His name is Dario, and he'll be chairing a Q&A for the next five minutes. Thank you. We're actually running a little uh, short on time, so we're gonna move the Q&A till after. So right now what I'd like to do is introduce Relic for the uh, Vive Hand Tracking SDK. Hello everyone, thank you, for all, uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Relic. I'm leading HTC Beijing Research Center for VR technology and the computer vision. Today I'm happy to share, uh, share the hand tracking SDK to you. <clears throat> okay. We believe uh, the, the, uh, the future interaction in VR world should be more natural. People can use their hand to interact in VR world just like their daily life in the real world. So, when Vive launched in 2016, the onboard camera of Vive 
is a good bridge to link variety and the virtual. So we start to research what we can do on this camera. So this is our result. We use deep learning based CV to create a real-time gesture recognition technology. With the onboard camera, we want to provide a high accuracy and a low latency hand tracking SDK. The solution is purely software driven and does not require additional, uh, additional hardware. So it can be easily to extend to different devices. It supports all Vive products on multiple platforms and the game engines. Since we use it in the VR application, we assume it is in the first person view. The SDK get camera images from devices and provide the hand position and the gesture type. You can know how many hands are detected, whether they are left or right. We also provide a predefined gesture set for each hand. Now we support five gestures. They are OK, pointing, thumbs up, five, and a fist. We also provide the hand position such as 2D and the 3D point mode, with the center position of the hand is provided. On powerful devices, we also have a skeleton mode with 21 3D key point that can be used to bring your hand from, uh, from real world into the virtual world. Okay. Sorry. Okay, uh, this video showed the ability of the hand tracking SDK. It's run on Vive Pro with skeleton mode. You can see the completed skeleton is drawn as key point and the links. The color of links indicate different gesture, predef uh, predefined gestures. For demo purpose, we use different color to show each uh, predefined gesture. When there are multiple hands detected, the color, of, uh, the color of the key point is used to distinguish between left hand and the right hand. When you move your hand and the fingers, the skeleton will update the code accordingly. Okay, hand trick SDK support all five products. Left and the right hand Gesture and the 2D point mode are support on all products. The 3D point mode need a dual camera, so uh, it did not support on Vive. Vive Pro and the Pro I support all the features. Vive Focus and the Focus Plus support all except skeleton mode at this moment. We also have a speed test report for hand tracking SDK. The test run on our local machine and the, and the actual result may vary depending on the settings. On Windows, we test it on, with NVIDIA uh, GTX 1060 and AMD RX 480, which should be the uh, bottom line of the VR graphic card. The Vive and the Vive Pro can reach 40 to 60 frames per second in 2D and 3D mode, and 25 to 45 frames per second in skeleton mode. In Vive, uh, in Vive Focus, it can reach 20 and 30 frames per second in 2D and 3D mode. We use only one CPU core in Android system for five focus, because we need to leave the GPU, DSP, and the remaining CPU for six staff tracking, VR rendering, and the game calculation.
The SDK packages support multiple platforms and game engines. The platform we support are Windows for Vive and the Vive Pro series, and Android for Vive Focus series. For Unity plugin, it supports all platforms. We also provide the sample code of demo project in the Unity plugin. For the Unreal plugin, now support a Windows system, and we plan to support Android in Q2 this year. We also have a native, uh, native library for the developer who using other game engine. It supports all platforms. And for Android Java developer, we also have an AR plugin. Okay, we build a simple demo to show what hand tracking can do with the feature we provide. Gesture can be used as a trigger point to different actions. For example, you can see the demo. You can, you can, use, the, uh, you can use the fist to prepare and the five to shoot a laser. The beam will follow the position and the location of your hand and interact to the object. You can also grab or move a box with both your hand. Of course, or use your right hand to summon a box by drawing a pattern. The hand skeleton can use to, uh, can add a collider to grab or touch a box or using a, a collider for UI interaction. Okay, draw a pattern to summon a new box and using the collider to grab and touch a box. and the UI interaction. This demo is run on Vive uh, Pro with skeleton mode. However, the same effect can be achieved in Vive Focus with 3D point mode. The gesture still can be used to trigger an action And the 3D position can be used to shoot a laser or calculate collision. These two demos are built using Unity in a single project with a few coding lines to handle the difference between 3D point mode and the skeleton mode. So most of the code can be shared on Vive, Vive Pro and Vive Focus. Okay. Okay, we have introduced the basic of hand tracking SDK. Now we will brief describe how to use the SDK. You can also refer to the SDK documentation for more details. We start from native library because this is the basic of all other plugin. The function declare in this SDK is, is very are very simple. To start detection. Get the, get the result repeatedly and the stop the detection. The caller can decide when to start and the stop the detection. Since the detection need to consume the computing power, so you, you only need to start detection when you need the hand result and the stop the detection when it is no longer needed or when the application enter pause state. This is the start, uh, start detection API. This, API. this API is a non-blocking API and, the, and the returns before the detection is actually start. The start time may vary depending on hardware to hardware. This API also have a, an option to determine what backend and the mode, uh, mode to use. The backend decides where, the detect, where to run the detection in Windows, only, uh, only GPU is support, 
and Android with support to run the detection in GPU or CPU. But we, we uh, recommend to uh, set to auto backend because it can provide the best experience on VR application. You can also specify the duration mode for you to use. That is skeleton, 3D, or 2D mode. But the skeleton mode is not support for all products. So if the skeleton mode is not support due to the hardware limitation, it will fall back to previous state. That is from skeleton to 3D to 2D. And the multiple call to this function have no effect. The stop detection is very simple. It's a blocking function and the return uh, after the detection is actually stopped. Also, multiple call to this function has no effect. The code should periodically call the uh, get gesture result function to pull the result. It returns the hand result in the pointer, which is managed by the SDK. Since we assume the user is in the first person view, so it returns at most one left hand and one right hand. Each hand contains left, right hand flag, gesture type, and the position info in world coordinate. Also, the, a frame index can be used to determine if the result is updated between consequence code to this function. Normally, if the result is not updated, many calculations can be avoided to save the computing power. Okay, uh, the Unity and Unreal plugin is based on native plugin and provide more advanced features for ease of use. In Unity plugin, a gesture provider script should be added to the render camera. This script handles start, stop, and the pro result automatically based on Unity mono behavior lifecycle. In Unreal, you, uh, you need to add Vive hand tracking component to your scene and the provide blueprint function mentioned in native plugin. The hand renderer script is used to create a completed hand in Unity. You can set the parameter to change the color of the key point, hand, or links. Sorry. Or the color of the predefined gesture. You can also add a collider to this hand for interaction with other objects. We also provide a quick state check API for Unity and Unreal to infer the state of the detection. There are four states available. Now start, starting, running, or error occurred. Except for running state, the hand result is always empty. To simplify the way to get the result, Unity and the uh, Unity and the Unreal plugin provide direct access to get resolve hand, uh, right hand and left hand. It also provides a quick check if the results are updated in this in this frame. Okay, uh, finally we will show two demos to show how hand tracking SDK can be used in actual VR application. The first one is a uh, white paper. It's a, read, uh, it's a VR reading application that user can interact in the virtual, uh, virtual books by flipping and the click button. So there are two actions defined in white paper with the position of the hand. The first one is move your hand to the edge of the book and move to the left. Then this page will flip to next. Second, move your hand to a button and hold. Then this button will be triggered. White paper is available for all white product. 
on Vi port. We also launch it at uh, at Google Play for and uh, for mobile and the uh, uh, App Store for iPhone. That means the hand tracking is supposed on all these these platforms. The second one is drawing app. This is another good example that show how we can use the gesture and the hand position. In this application, right hand is used to draw a 3D line in the scene. And left hand is used to control the drawing. For example, to change color, to reset, to start and stop with different predefined gesture. Since 3D mode is support, the final drawing is a 3D model that can be viewed in any direction and the location. Okay. The SDK now is available for download in Vive Develop website. The entire, entire package includes documentation, simple project, and the plugin for all supported game engines. We also have a forum, so if you have any question, welcome to post and contact to us. That's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. So if you can just come up to the mic. Uh, yes, go ahead. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the tools that you guys are providing are wonderful. Um, as far as the Unity tools, I was curious with Unity switching to ECS so rapidly, um, how quickly would you guys be updating the same tools to fit with that? I'm sorry, to fit with which tool? With Unity ECS. With Unity ECS for, this, for the audio. This is for the audio? Uh, it's for a lot of the tools, but the audio was a, a big one that got me to ask the question. So, uh, sorry, that's, a, that's okay. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'm Avril, sound designer. Thank you. <laughs> um, much appreciate. Uh, so, I have a question about the 3D SDK that you guys have. Um, is it only on Unity right now, or is it? Are the future plans for Unreal as well? It's for uh, all of them. Is it for all of them? Yeah, yeah, native okay. too. Cool, okay, thank you. That's, that, that was my question. Sure. Hi there, thanks so much for the talk. Um, I had a question about the uh, audio demo. Um, when the, uh, during the uh, reverberation demo in the room, um, through these speakers anyway, it sounded a little bit actually unnatural. Um, and I, uh, I wanted to just hear thoughts on, I have a couple of ideas in my head as to why maybe it, it might work uh, in certain circumstances, but didn't sound right in this, but I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are on. Do you want to take this one, Avery? Okay. Uh, so our, our sound propagation, uh, like Avery said, it's limited to rectangular spaces right now and uh, a couple of predefined materials. It, this is one of those things that doesn't demo especially well because if you notice it, then it kind of misses the point. So I think that maybe those settings were dialed into very reflective materials, am I correct? Yeah, it's like concrete and, and yeah. So I, I found in using this effect in real-time sound design applications, it's good for highly geometric spaces like bathrooms where you would want those early reflections, uh, things that don't necessarily add up to an impression of reverb necessarily, but more like standing waves. Um, and then you have your conventional sound design techniques like convolution reverb, the reverb zones in Unity. Um, and then again, when we have more complex room modeling, uh, that'll be a, a fixture than other kinds of applications. So, 
Yeah. I, I was also thinking um, the room was also, I'm assuming it was simulating an empty room. It is, is that correct as well? Yeah. Unclear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, sorry. If, yeah. Is there? Uh, there's actually a lot of people. I had a question about performance stuff. I don't know how much time do we have for questions. Is, do I have one more? You, you can catch us right after the session, so we can. Okay. Up. Cool. Thanks. Hi, Hi. Thank you for the talk. I have a question for uh, one of the slides of uh, Avery. I think um, it, it was about the CPU usage of the uh, 3D. Um, Rendering, uh, it was saying 40, 14% and then 9 or 8% with the light uh, uh, settings. But what does that correspond to? Like, like um, how many sources or what are you doing actually? And, 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 and in general, what, what are we to expect, expect in CPU usage? Yeah. Oh, hello. Excuse me. OK, OK. Uh, in my, in, in my, you, you mean in my slider and I show you the computing consumption? Yes. Yeah. Okay, it is just an example, but uh, I, I did uh, list uh, the condition in uh, my slider below. Okay, and uh, but, but I still can tell you uh, there are 12, 12 uh, audio source and uh, one room aperture and one occlusion aperture in our testing condition. And uh, uh, actually, uh, I did some uh, optimizations uh, for computing because I adapt our library setting. Uh, I mute uh, the. I, I choose uh, the best uh, different difference is uh, I choose on uh, the geometry occlusion model and with a uh, extremely free lightweight mode, and so I can save a lot of computing resource. Yeah, I, I I'm not sure if I respond to your question. I, I'll talk to you after. It. Okay. <laughs> Next. I'm ready to go? Okay, thank you for the presentation. I have two questions for the hand tracking. So for the demo videos, I noticed that the 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 player's hands moves really slow. Is this for the demonstration purpose or it will lose the track if it moves faster? <laughs> no, Just curious. Uh, you mean the last uh, drawing app, right? Uh, yeah, for the demonstration video is uh, the one that's the salmon, the boxes. Yeah, uh, our R&D uh, use the normal behavior when you draw in. So uh -huh. I'm not sure it is faster or slower. Uh-huh, okay, so yeah. that's, uh, we, we that's... think uh, because uh, the, frame, uh, the frame per second, we can reach to 20 to 30 mm -hmm. in fo focus, right? So we have test that uh, it should be okay, okay for natural interaction. Right, that's awesome. Okay, I think if okay, you can try it. Okay, sure. That's all we have for, for questions. We'll be available afterwards if we can continue outside. So thanks everyone for coming.